Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Christopher Ryan. Chris is a best-selling author with a background in psychology. After completing his PhD at Saybrook University, he reached international acclaim with his first book, Sex at Dawn, co-authored with Casilda Jether. More recently, he authored the book Civilized to Death, which levels a damning critique of modern civilization. He also contributes to Psychology Today and is the host of the podcast Tangentially Speaking with Dr. Christopher Ryan. Today, we talk about the idea that rather than being the huge positive that we're told it is, civilization actually stacks up rather poorly when compared with hunter-gatherer lifestyles. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. Okay, I am here with Christopher Ryan. Chris, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Good to be here. So the um, the idea that we're going to be kind of talking about today, you know, we both, I think, uh, our culture kind of feeds this idea that this is the best time ever to be alive, right? That um, things have been getting better and better all the time. And I think it's fair to say both of us think that's a kind of a lie that we've been fed by the culture. Um, when did you first, do you remember when you first, when this first kind of dawned on you that maybe the far distant past may not have been as brutish and terrible as we're told it is? Well, you know, my first intellectual passion was um, Native American cultures. When I was probably 11 or so, I, I think I read my first book um, talking about how I was growing up in Western Pennsylvania in the United States. And, and I remember reading a book about the Indian people who lived in that area and how they lived. And, um, and I just got obsessed with it. Um, and I, from 11 till probably, uh, you know, until girls really entered my world at 15 or 16, all I was interested in was native American culture. So I read, everything I could get my hands on. And of course, uh, if you immerse yourself in those sorts of books, it becomes pretty clear pretty early um, that, you know, in Cowboys and Indians, I always wanted to be the Indian, you know, it, it, there was uh, uh, something about the way they live. Now, of course, this was in the 70s. Um, there was a fair bit of romanticization going on um, of Native American people and cultures. Um, but I wasn't just reading sort of popularized stuff. I was reading anthropological studies. I was reading historical works like Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Uh, that was a very, very important book for me when I was probably 12 or 13. So I was uh, very familiar from a very young age with alternative viewpoints of certainly American history and manifest destiny and um, the idea that just because one culture uh, is able to dominate another culture uh, militarily or economically doesn't mean that it's a better culture or that its people are any happier. And I remember reading a lot of anecdotal accounts of people in the colonial uh, America who ran away to live with the Indians. And until I started really researching Civilized to Death, I just thought those were sort of famous accounts because they were counterintuitive. And, you know, that's the sort of story that sticks in people's minds and stands out. Um, but then when I was researching Civilized to Death, I, I found that, in fact, there were laws in colonial America that prohibited uh, Europeans from running off to live with the Indians because so many of them were doing it, that they had to actually pass laws. And uh, there are very few, if any, accounts of Native people willingly choosing to come and live in, um, you know, the colonial agricultural societies. Um, so, yeah, that you know, getting back to your question, that that's really my first consciousness of it. So writing this book was very much sort of um, you know, a closing of a, a big circuit in my life, I think. Right. Isn't, isn't there even the kind of um, example of the inverse where you talk about in the book where I think it was in an early kind of colonial exploration, um, some an indigenous person from the Americas was taken back to England and was introduced to the king and was dressed in kind of Western clothing and and then they kind of thought, oh, like he, he won't go back to his, you know, his tribe right once 
uh, now that we've shown him all the wonders of civilization. And then as soon as they go past the islands again, he like takes off all the Western clothing, runs back to his community reigns, and they're just kind of appalled. They're like, wait, what? Did you, you actually like living this way? <laughs> you know, why why isn't why doesn't everyone agree our way's better? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. It's uh, those the people you're referring to actually were from Tierra del Fuego, and they were picked up by um, Captain Fitzroy, who was the captain of the Beagle on a previous voyage. And the idea was, as you describe it, the idea was quite uh, literally to bring them back to England, show them how amazing uh, British life was. Um, and then after they were indoctrinated into b- the British approach to life to take them back so that they would tell all their people, Hey, these British are amazing. They have a great way of living. We should help them and, uh, really sign up for this, uh, colonial project. And in fact, what happened was, as you described the, the three of them just went right back to living as they had uh, abandoned the huts and the gardens that the British had built for them. And Darwin writes about them because he was on the ship with them all the way from England to Tierra del Fuego. So he knew them quite well. And um, they found one of them uh, named Jemmy and uh, brought him on the ship to have dinner. And Darwin writes in his journal that he had never seen such a, um, such a fall from, you know, the way Jemmy had been when they dropped him off, dressed up in, you know, his British clothes and all that, uh, to as he was now. Uh, It was really a a tragic sight from Darwin's perspective. But Darwin wrote that he was happy at least to see that Jemmy still remembered how to use a knife and fork and, you know, eat properly at the table. And they said to him, uh, you know, Jemmy, like, do you want to, you want us to take you back to England? You know, we'll, we can bring you back and you can live your life in England. And he said, no, 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 I don't want to. I want to stay here. And they said, well, why did you abandon the gardens that we made for you? And he said, why should I garden? There are plenty of birdies, plenty of fishies. Like the, the world is full of food. Why do you guys want me to work so hard? And you see the same kind of incomprehension over and over and over, this mutual incomprehension where the Europeans are saying, why don't you work? Why don't you grow food? Why don't you scratch the earth? And the native people are saying, why would you do that? You know, there's the famous story of the Kung San man in in, uh, present day Botswana and the Kalahari, same kind of conversation. And they're saying to him, why don't you farm? We're giving you tools. We're showing you how to do this. And he says, why should I farm when there's so many mongo mongo nuts in the world, right? Just doesn't make sense. And also a similar, more recent example where you describe a guy who, a documentary filmmaker, who's, who's filming with some indigenous people and then they want to come visit him. Is that, they visit him in England, I think? Yeah, Johnny Hughes. Uh, I think he was working for the BBC in Papua New Guinea Um, And they spent quite a bit of time, I think several months, uh, way back in the, I think in the Belen Valley, which is quite remote, and, um, you know, filming how people live there, sort of, you know, quote unquote, Stone Age people. And, um, And at some point, some of the local people said to him, uh, hey, you've seen how we live. Why don't you take us back and show us how you live? And, you know, everyone laughed at the time, but then later he thought, man, that would be a really interesting documentary, right? To bring them into the modern world. And he pitched the idea to his supervisors at the BBC and they said, yeah, well, we could pay for that. That's a great idea. So, of course, first he was really worried um, that they would come to England. And I think this was probably in the 80s or 90s. And he said um, that he was really afraid they'd come, you know, to the modern world and never want to go back because they'd see all the wonders and like, well, why should I go back and, you know, live in squalor um, when I could have all this? And he contacted a few anthropologists um, and 
without exception, the anthropologists sort of laughed at him and said, don't worry about that, man. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Uh, people love, you know, the world that they're born into generally. And in any case, there's no uh, evidence that Native people would prefer our life. So they went ahead and, and brought these guys to England and... Uh, I think they spent a few weeks. It's been it's been a while since I uh, have looked at the original you know, at Johnny Hughes's um, remarks. I think the main source of information he's Johnny Hughes has written a couple of books, but I think he talks about this mostly it was in a radio interview. Um, anyway, he uh, he flies them out, and they spent a couple months in the UK. Took them around, showed them all sorts of things. Um, and he, he talks about this amazing breakfast uh, conversation one morning when uh, the guys were staying at the house of one of his producers and um, they were having breakfast and it was very early and, you know, sort of typical dark British morning, probably raining outside. And, and the guys, the husband said, okay, well, you know, I've got to go to work now. And one of the, the native guy said, uh, why do you, where do you go all day? Because you leave before the light comes and you're back when it's dark again. Where are you all day? And he said, well, I'm working. I have to work, you know? And the guy said, well, uh, why do you have to work so much? And he said, well, I have to pay for this house, for example. And the guy said, wow, okay. How many days do you have to work to pay for your house? And he explained the 30 year mortgage and the, the the native guys were just like, are you kidding? 30 years? When we need a house, we get together. We build a house in a couple of days. We have a house. That's it. 30 years. Incomprehensible. So, yeah, there are many examples of this sort of thing. When those guys went back to Papua New Guinea, of, all, of everything that they had seen in the modern world, the only thing that they wanted to take back with them to introduce into their culture was putting um feathers on arrows that really impressed them i guess i guess they had uh, visited an archery range and they saw the feathers on the arrows and they were like now that's a good idea that's something we can use <laughs> okay. so like we're i guess what we're contrasting here right whether it's in the present day or in the past is kind of uh, state-based societies based around agriculture and and technological production versus I think you use the term immediate return hunter-gatherers is that the kind of anthropological term for foragers yeah yeah there's a bit of confusion around the term hunter-gatherer and, and forager and all that um, so what we're talking about uh, that's relevant to our uh, evolutionary history is immediate return hunter gatherers. So these are people who don't have accumulated resources at all. Uh, so they eat what they have hunted that day or gathered that, that day. Um, you know, there might be some food that sits around for a few days, but they're also nomadic. So anything that they accumulate, they have to carry. Um, so they, they tend not to accumulate much. The confusion comes in because anthropologists sometimes refer to complex hunter-gatherers, um, like the, um, the, the people who lived in the Pacific Northwest are, are an example of this, where they have accumulated uh, salmon that they've, you know, there's a seasonal surplus of salmon. They catch more salmon than, it, than they can eat. They smoke it. They save it for the winter. These societies tend to um, drift into the same sorts of political hierarchies and um, systematic aggression that we see in agricultural societies. So you have, you know, the Chumash, for example, that had slavery, they have um, political hierarchies, um, and they're quite warlike. Um, which makes sense because when you have an accumulation of resources, suddenly there's something worth fighting over, right? There's something you're willing to risk your life to defend. Someone else is willing to risk their life to plunder. So it sends society into a whole different realm 
than immediate return hunter gatherers who are nomadic. So they're not really concerned about defending any particular um, piece of real estate like a river with, that has lots of salmon. Uh, they're not, they don't have resources that they're worried about um, defending. Um, and uh, so it's a very different kind of uh, approach to life. It's interesting that these immediate return hunter-gatherers, we would look at them and say they have nothing. And yet their approach to life is built around an assumption of abundance. Whereas, you know, we look at ourselves and we say we have everything. We have so much food, so much technological wealth and um and yet we live as if there's an assumption of scarcity. It's one of the central conundrums, I think, of human life that uh, Marshall Salins addressed in his pivotal paper, um, The Original Affluent Society, where he was one of the first anthropologists to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We keep talking about hunter-gatherers as if they're so poor because they have very few material possessions and yet look at how they live let's actually um, measure the quality of life based upon something more um, substantial and, and 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 appropriate than simply material possessions Let's look at leisure time. Let's look at nutrition. Let's look at sense of community. Let's look at a sense of meaning in life. Let's look at personal freedom, freedom from violence, freedom from oppression, systematized, systematic oppression. Well, they come out way ahead on all these matrices. Yeah, it's really interesting, the idea that it seems like a paradox at first, right, that the people with so much extra food that it's going to waste. They're the ones who, and other, you know, other goodies as well. The, we're the ones who have this scarcity, scarcity mindset. But then there's the interesting kind of thing, where I guess we can see it's not a coincidence because the whole, our whole culture is based around the idea of, of seeing nature as this kind of threatening enemy that we need to dominate. Like the scarcity mindset's there from the beginning. It's kind of like, you know, someone who becomes a billionaire um, and then just doesn't can't stop, can't be happy, can't just kind of rest on their laurels and you know they hit retirement and they're still spending all their time working instead of spending time with their family. And you realize, okay, there's a pathology there. Then the problem was never they didn't have enough money, maybe it was in the beginning, but it becomes a psychological pathology, right? Yeah, I think you're right. We see it playing out on a on a global level, and we also see it playing out on a personal level. And there are the, you know, uh, what's the the famous film about Hearst uh, by uh, uh, Orson Welles. You know what I'm talking oh, about? Of uh, course, yeah. The one with Rosebud, yeah. uh, Citizen Kane. Yeah, Rosebud. Yeah, Citizen Kane, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's basically a story of that, right? Of a man seeking wealth, seeking power, and then just spinning off into lunacy because there's never enough. And eventually it results in paranoia and you know the the same mania that that drove him towards success drives him over the edge into insanity and um you know it, it's been argued that western civilization is essentially a post-traumatic um stress disordered social configuration that that there's some horrible conflagration uh, or or natural disaster in our collective past um, that has marked the our approach to life um, and that we're all living within this dysfunctional you know PTSD society right yeah that really resonates I um before I came before I read your book I was I was digging around in that area trying to thinking exactly along those lines you know like was it that you know, in the Middle East where you have these big civilizations popping up around agriculture, was there some, was it just that there was so much war and so much trauma of some kind that it led people into this, this mode dominated by fear? But there's a really fascinating bit in your book where you talk about a, um, when you get Gobekli Tepe, the, you know, this, this um, megalithic structure being built 12,000 years ago in what's now Turkey, the idea that the climate was really um, going through a, a period that was really kind of 
good for us. It was, it was kind of like a garden of Eden, you know, just real abundance. Mm. And then in that situation, we start to build megalithic structures. We, you know, we, we invent this really cool culture that we, we kind of really enjoying. And then suddenly the, the, the period of, of abundance falls away, but we've already started to live this certain kind of lifestyle. And then that's how we kind of cross this threshold into, um, into this trap of agriculture where there's no way out apart from collapse really. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I hope there may be another way out, but it, it seems like there is and yeah. no one else has ever found it. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's interesting how it, it seems that there was a period, you know, now as science has advanced and we're able to look at, um, you know, pollen counts in, in core samples that are being taken. And we have a pretty good sense of, you know, how they correspond to different um, historical moments. Uh, there does seem to have been uh, an, a period of unusual abundance. And that was an incredibly rich part of the world. Uh, herds of aurochs, which are like giant cattle, um, not trees, fruit trees, just, you know, a place where just food was everywhere. And so what happened, which is what always happens, is that the population of, you know, animal life responds to this abundance of resources with its own increase. And then when climate changes, as it tends to do, uh, then there's a die off, right? Because suddenly there isn't as much. It happens with rabbits. It happens with coyotes. It happens with deer. It happens with everything. Um, but someone figured out how to start manipulating the environment in such a way that the die off wouldn't be as dramatic, bringing water to some of those nut and fruit trees that were withering by digging a trench, uh, is pro probably the first uh, innovation along those lines. Um, and then once that happened, it seemed like a great idea, right? You can imagine whoever came up with that idea, I'm sure was a hero or heroine. Uh, like they saved a lot of lives and, um, you know, you can't blame them for it. Uh, the, I, I often get the question, you know, if agriculture, uh, is such a disaster for our species, then why did we do it? Why did we choose it? And of course that just misunderstands the way things happen, right? Like nobody sat down one day and said, let's do agriculture, you know, and, you know, thought through the implications of it. Like, no, that's not how things happen. So yeah, I, you called it the agriculture trap. And I, I think that's a good way to look at it. It's a ratcheting process. Because once you start manipulating the environment and population increases in response to that, then you need to increase the manipulations. You need more land that creates the need for aggression, a standing army, uh, changes your relationship with neighboring people, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, once you go down that path, it's very, very difficult to, to trace your steps backwards. Right. And then I guess it kind of brings us back to where we, we began with this, the narrative that we're, we're brought up with, which you, you call in the book, the, the narrative of perpetual progress or MPP. Um, it seems to me yeah, that, that at that point, as soon as you have agriculture, you have excess food by definition, and you get kind of whoever controls that food suddenly has power, right? So you get hierarchies and then they are the people who get to set this to tell the story that this is actually a really good idea and everyone should keep working for me we should, you know you slaves should feel really lucky that you're you're working for me um and then we end up with yeah. even in the modern day with this this narrative of perpetual progress yeah for sure um the only the only element of what you just said that i i might uh edit a little bit is the extra food because population grows so quickly that you always have right. starving people. And so you have this sort of Malthusian uh, process where, you know, there are always people who don't have enough and there are people who have plenty. And so you get that sort of uh, class system uh, built into any kind of agricultural uh, settlement. And yeah, the, the people at the top, um, 
control the narrative, of course, control what's considered, you know, a, a legitimate complaint or or what's a possible, you know, the realm of possibility in terms of change. I'm often re- reminded, I wrote about this in, in Sex at Dawn, the, my previous book. I don't think I talked about it in Civilized to Death, but there was a term in the 18... 18- 50s, 60s in the Southern United States, of course, where slavery was uh, built into the economy, there was a medical term called drapedomania, which was, you know, this was written about in medical journals, uh, taken seriously. And it was a, a form of mental illness that struck slaves sometimes um, that made them so delusional that they thought that they should be free, that they didn't accept the clear reality that they were inferior to white people and that they were lucky to be owned by white people. Um, And, you know, so it's like we're surrounded by this sort of thing. And, And of course, I'm sure we have many similar delusions in our present day. Uh, there's no reason to think we're free of them, but yeah, the, it's it's amazing when you you know, a lot of people would think of it as taking the red pill, right? Where you step out and you're like, oh my god, this is all an illusion. This is all, you know, a system of interlocking um, uh, lies and advertisements and propaganda. And uh, it all fits together so beautifully. Yeah, I think I think those delusions to me are the the signal that more than anything else that um, the culture we're living in is not healthy. There's a signal that it's pathological in some way. I think a healthy person, a healthy culture, doesn't have to have delusions that they hold on to. You know, you hold on to delusion because there's some intense emotion usually behind it, like fear or something. So you have to have it be a certain way. And yeah, in our culture, you know, so my background is in kind of psychology and neuroscience and when you're when you're told things like depression is a biochemical imbalance in the brain that just this is purely physical thing don't bother asking about the socioeconomic situation don't bother asking about if there are structural inequalities it's just this like yeah. this malfunction and then suddenly you, you you as you describe you kind of you suddenly see like oh wait a minute this is a culture that's so it's it's picked up so so much momentum that the stories it tells and that honest people believe serve the culture rather than rather than being in the service of kind of calmly objectively looking at the truth because if we calmly and objectively look at the truth then suddenly we're asking questions like well is the prison system justifiable given that you know a lot of the people are there because of kind of structural inequities and the culture would doesn't want to kind of ask those questions instead we're kind of stuck in this yeah system of delusion and propaganda yeah i i often think about that um, yeah, I used to think about it all the time uh, in my 20s uh, when I was um, more involved with psychedelics and, and found um, psychedelics to be a very um, helpful um, teaching, uh, learning uh, aid, I guess we could say, educational aid. And, you know, my experiences with psychedelics were, were so helpful and interesting and, you know, literally uh, mind altering in a very positive way. And yet I was aware of the fact that if I ever got caught with a pocket full of mushrooms or LSD or whatever, uh, I'd be put in a cage, you know, for decades, Um, you know, minimum mandatory sentencing guidelines passed in the United States in the 1980s under the Reagan administration specified in in this, you know, by you, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but for any of your audience who who isn't aware of this, this means that that a judge cannot um, alter the sentence. There's a grid. So if you have a hundred hits of LSD in your pocket, that means that's for distribution that means you go away for 10 years. And the judge can't say, oh, but this person has no prior convictions. This person's a model citizen, so I'm going to reduce it. The judges couldn't do anything. It's just a mathematical formula. And that was higher than the average sentence for second-degree murder. 
So people are still in prison in the United States for, you know, selling magic mushrooms at a Grateful Dead show, a drug that's not addictive, that wasn't making money for Colombian drug cartels. You know, there's no money laundering happening. It's just hippies getting high and listening to, you know, what I consider to be not such great music. But uh, people are in a cage. Their entire lives are ruined for that. So I often thought like, oh, why, why is every society I, I know anything about that had access to psychedelic substances consider them to be the greatest gift of the gods, sacred, and here we are uh, penalizing them more than murder. What does that say? To me, that says we live in a society that doesn't want people to think, doesn't want people to see through the nonsense. I think you're totally right. I mean, if you look at the kind of history, it's, you know, the proximate cause of the kind of aggressive um, clampdown rate seems to be that people were unwilling, more and more young people were unwilling to fight in Vietnam, you know, fight these unjust wars. But behind that is what you're saying. It's a perspective difference. You know, you've got the mainstream culture that's part of the narrative of perpetual progress, which is kind of marching forward uh, in its in its narrative. And then you've got these young people who actually are kind of, you know, want to kind of go live in communes and, and arguably in kind of egalitarian structures that do approximate these kinds of more naturalistic kind of hunter-gatherer. Obviously, they're, they're not hunt, doing hunting and gathering, but they're taking inspiration from these ways of living and, and it's resonating more. So yeah, it really, it, I think once you've tried these substances, you can quite easily see that it is a war between these two, these two visions of what humans should really be, right? Yeah, very much. And, and you're right that, you know, the communes weren't actually hunting and gathering, although they did adopt a lot of the, you know, the fashion, you know, the, the fringe jackets and the buckskin and the moccasins and, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, but they were very much about getting back to the land, about cooperation, about uh, anti-consumerism and, and sort of a, a minimalistic uh, approach to uh, economic life. Uh, Timothy Leary famously said, tune in, turn on and drop out, right? So a lot of it was about, hey, uh, the values that this society is built on aren't my values. And of course, my personal <clears throat> uh, perspective on all this, I often see things as hunter-gatherer versus agriculture. And so, you know, the political divide, the hippies versus conservatives, um, it's very much uh, a hunter-gatherer versus agriculturalist approach. Um, you know, with the, the sort of hippie movement, uh, counterculture movement being a, a hunter-gatherer value structure. Uh, we value friendship and free time and artistic creativity um, much more than we value how big your house is or how many cars we have or, you know, washing machines and all this kind of business. Um, so, yeah, you can sort of see this, this, struggle, which I, I think is maybe one of the deepest human struggles playing out in all kinds of places. Um, you know, even, you know, the sort of political divides, you know, between the, you know, in the United States, it's the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, and of course, the argument can be made that Democrats aren't actually what they pretend to be, but let's say they are, they're, you know, look out for everybody. We're all in this together, universal health care, tax the rich so that everyone has enough. This is a very hunter gatherer egalitarian set of values. Whereas in the other side, private property, this is mine, keep your hands off it. Uh, I have the right to resort to violence to protect what I own, you know, all this kind of, that's very agricultural um you know stance and so <laughs> i see it, it, it it's always the same struggle playing out again and again and again in in so many different realms yeah there's a bit where you you describe the kind of difference here as, as being fear versus love which usually resonated with me i think that after all the kind of processing of all this information i think that's ultimately what i come down to as well is is as we've said that the kind of agriculturalist or you know, Nixon's mindset in this analogy is based around fear and um, 
and that's why you're kind of looking into the future because things aren't okay and you need to kind of race into the future versus a mode of being in the present, trying to live life as in this kind of try to maximize well-being and kind of interpersonal flourishing. Um, and yeah, I, I think that it's interesting to me that the um, the the fear side, uh, you know, in the past, I'd often wondered if this was something that emerged very, very gradually uh, through kind of, you know, um, cultural evolution after the emergence of agriculture. But then reading about these, these people in the Pacific Northwest that you mentioned who, um, you know, it's not that there's a giant, civilization with skyscrapers and everything but it's just the fact of the hoarded of the kind of stockpiled salmon is enough to create conflict and um it starts to make me wonder if this is something the fear side is really has always been with us and has always been a um yeah something that could come out and um another thing in the book that relates to this was you talk about the idea of this kind of fierce egalitarianism in, in hunter gatherer groups and it's kind of like a, it seems like a kind of a constant keeping on top of the potentiality for some sociopathic or narcissistic or, you know, psychopathic person to start to try to dominate. And there's a great example, I'm not sure what the culture was, but where if, if some young guy kind of catches a huge, like kills a huge animal, then the other guys will kind of um, basically say like, oh, what'd you drag us out here for, for this skin and bones, right? Like, to because they know yeah. to, like, to minimize that his ego could get out of the way and he could start thinking he should boss other people around, right? So do you think that that, like, yeah. that's, that shadow side, I guess, has always been inside us? Yeah, yeah, I think so. There's, there's a wonderful book about this by Christopher Bohm called Hierarchy in the Forest. And um, he's, he's really the best known expert on the sorts of mechanisms that you're talking about. Um, and what, what he says in that, he makes a, a nuanced uh, argument where he says that humans are hierarchical beings like all social primates are, right? Chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, like baboons. We all live within social hierarchies. And that what our ancestors did that's very interesting is that they developed anti-hierarchical mechanisms to keep that natural impulse in check. So as you say, there are mechanisms. Uh, I think the, the particular story you're talking about is the Kung San in, in the Kalahari. But um, I remember in writing the book, I, I chose different examples from, from different cultures all over the world, and they all have the same sorts of things. They have um, the sort of ridicule that you're talking about, where if someone starts getting too big for his britches, people start joking about, oh, hey, you know, he thinks he's a big man over here, and, you know, that's sort of knocking him down a few pegs. If that doesn't work, then uh, a shaman or an elder might take him aside and say, hey, you need to calm down a little bit. You know, we all depend on each other here. We're all in this together. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then that person can very easily have a hunting accident um, because everybody's armed and everyone's very adept with their weapons. So, uh you know, I don't care how big and strong you are, you get an arrow in the back, you know, you're going to fall just as hard as anyone else. So, um, you know, Christopher Bohm talks about how the fact that our ancestors were all armed really negates the sort of innate um, leverage that a bigger, stronger person might have. Um, and it's had really interesting effects on our evolution as a species because it of course takes the evolutionary advantage off these sorts of purely physiological uh, advantages so yeah it's it's quite interesting and i think you're right i think there's always that impulse to try to coerce other people to do what you want or to try to um you know get possessive or you know uh take a little more for yourself or for your friend or your, your woman or whatever. 
Um, but hunter gatherer societies are extremely sensitive to those things and, um, you know, hoarding food or not distributing food, um, equitably is one of the, the biggest mistakes you can make in a hunter gatherer society. And of course, you know, those societies are built around mutual cooperation and, and mutual dependence. So, if you offend the group and you get expelled from the group, you're in big trouble. You know, we're not a species that, that lives well alone. Um, and uh, so it's essentially a death sentence if you're expelled from, from your group. Yeah. I, mean, I feel like the, if we're going to integrate the, like the lessons learned from, from our kind of hunter gatherer past, this is one of the things we'll have to do. And it'll be quite tricky, you know, in a world where, um, someone like Donald Trump can be elected president, there are clearly, we don't have this ethos of like, you know, that should be someone who who triggers all of our alarm bells of like, oh, no, 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 we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be egging that guy on. We should be reining him in. Um, and, yeah. but I, I think this should be happening, you know, in, I mean, it is happening in some communities where there's raised awareness around kind of narcissistic emotional abuse and these kinds of toxic personality traits. Um, but I, I guess I, I would like to see that, that spread globally where um, that's a real kind of accepted piece of our culture that we, we, you know, we're not, we're not talking about ostracizing these people. We're talking about kind of helping them. And, you know, this is where kind of psychedelics can potentially come in, right. That like you take someone who's, who's really their ego is too big and famously, you know, psychedelics are pretty good at destroying one's ego if used in the right way. Do you think that could be a, a kind of a way to approach it? Um, you know, I'm, I'm very hesitant to prescribe psychedelics uh, for that sort of thing, because I agree with you. I think, you know, you said if used in the right way, um, I think they can be ego dissolving, which is one of the, the best things about them. But I also see a lot of instant shamans walking around these days. Yeah, yeah. I see a lot of ego inflation, you know, and someone like Donald Trump, uh, who's dealing with deep psychological wounds from, you know, a mother who was not present, a father who abused him and, um, you know, could never be pleased. You know, he would never uh, get praise from his father. And, and I don't mean to psychoanalyze the guy, but uh, I don't know that he would actually benefit, um, you know, from psychedelics. I think he might just take it to the next level. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, am a big believer in psychedelic psychotherapy with, you know, for the right person in the right setting and, you know, the right therapist and all that. Um, but yeah, I, I think they cut, they can cut both ways, but you mentioned, you know, as far as politics goes, um, an extension of what I was talking about earlier is that in hunter gatherer politics, um, people become leaders because they're respected. Uh, so the, 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 whatever power they have is power that accrues to them because a, a lot of people really want to hear what they have to say. Um, you know, there's, there's this famous line in the movies where, you know, the, the Europeans land and they find some Indian, they say, take us to your chief. And there's, always confusion about that and there's confusion like you know who signs the treaties and this and that because there is no chief generally uh in most uh societies native societies there are different leaders for different things so there's someone whose opinion carries a lot of weight uh, as to whether or not we should go to war there's someone else whose opinion carries a lot of weight if someone's ill and what should we do about that? How can we help them? Someone else might uh, be much more respected in terms of deciding where to go hunting this season, or you know whether we should plant corn along the river. You know, all the the whole political structure is very fluid, and it's very much not about coercive power. It's about whose advice carries the most weight, basically. But everyone has the right to say whatever they want. And if you disagree vehemently with the decision that's made, 
you have the right to split off from the group and go join another group. It, the uh, technical term is fission fusion uh, social structures. They come together and they split apart and they, you know, coalesce in different groups. And so there's sort of movement between the different bands. Um, and normally there are seasonal get togethers where the bands will all join in one place and different, you know, people fall in love and they go off with this group because their mother's getting older and they want to be with her or whatever it is. Um, so that's sort of the typical uh, social fluidity. And in that sort of society, anyone who expresses a desire to be a leader, somebody who says, you know, I'm in charge here, is considered, as you say, pathetic and in need of help. It's not a sign of leadership, you know. We call it uh, in America. There's this whole this expression: Does he have the fire in the belly? You know, does he really want it? Does he have enough desire to really see it through to become a senator and win the election? That's the last person you would want in a position of leadership, right? There's something wrong with that guy. And I think it's the same. You know, we were talking earlier about wealth and how the same drive that that often brings someone to a position of great wealth um, you know, is revealed at that point as being pathological. I think it's the same for power. It's the same for um, you know, basically acquiring more than you need of anything um, from my perspective is, is a sign of a psychopathology. Yeah, I'd agree. And so you mentioned that this kind of fission fusion and uh, as well as these characteristics of hunter-gatherers, and then also we've spoken about the kind of fierce egalitarianism um, and the way, you know, I, you describe in the book as them kind of really prizing autonomy, you know, as you say, non, non-coercive, you can't, you can't impose your will on someone else. Um, but there's also this, this perspective of um, gratitude, of feeling like nature is this abundant um, positive presence and also you write about the idea that there are kind of generally benevolent uh, spirits as well versus the kind of monotheistic religions where it's more about a kind of hierarchical domineering paternalistic god right yeah the the entire approach to life uh, sort of relates back to what we were saying earlier about how you know hunter gatherers have very little but they act as if they have everything and we have so much and yet we act as if we never have enough um that extends into their spiritual perspectives as well um so hunter gatherers are without exception um pantheistic animistic so they have many gods uh and again the language becomes tricky when we talk about things across cultures like this So, you know, I said they have many gods, many societies. It's not a question of God. It's it's that the material world is imbued with spirit. So there are spirits in the waterfall. There are spirits in the clouds. There are spirits in the animals. Um, And so everything contains spirit. And our ancestors are present. Um, And so there's this sort of, um, you know, cyclical sense of the spirit world and the material world uh, sort of flowing into one another, which interestingly uh, seems to be kind of where quantum mechanics is going and, you know, advanced physics, not that I claim to understand it very well, but this sort of you know, energy becoming matter, becoming energy, becoming matter thing, you know, the wave particle uh, approach. Um, so anyway, yeah, the, the hunter-gatherer, uh, one of the central uh, pillars of um, approach to life that's common to hunter-gatherers is a sense of gratitude and a sense that um whatever spiritual beings there are, uh, like us. They take care of us. They look after us. They provide for us. Which makes sense. Uh, You know, when you look at the way a hunter-gatherer approaches life, um, why do I need to accumulate anything? Everything I need is right there, 
right? It's like if you lived in a grocery store, you would not, uh, you know, get yourself a refrigerator and keep your food in it. Like there's food everywhere. Why would I do that? Why would I need to do that? Um, and so, you know, I, I say it's it's kind of like if if you or I were given a, you know, whatever the best credit card is these days, an Amex black card or whatever, and just no limit, uh, whatever you need, you can always afford it. And uh, you never have to pay at the end of the month. Like that's how a hunter gatherer lives. Everything they need is around them. All the medicine, building materials to make your shelter, to make your tools, uh, food is everywhere. What do you need? Yeah. I mean, so we're, we're talking about kind of an evidence-based um, view of what, what hunter-gatherer life is, is like, right, from like anthropology. But then most of Western thought seems to be informed by these kinds of formative years of colonialism, where you have people like Thomas Hobbes, kind of this philosopher, effectively functioning as a kind of propagandist for saying that, um, yeah, life in non, non-state-based non societies is, is awful, nasty, brutish, and short, right, is the famous, famous phrase. Um, and that is a kind of a solitary, constant struggle to survive, right? Which is seems very different to, I mean, it seems to be just being plucked out of the air right? as a kind of, it really has the flavor of propaganda to me rather than philosophy or science. Yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, Thomas Hobbes didn't know anything about the way people actually lived in, you know, the pre-state world. He was, it was all conjecture. And like everyone else, his uh, sort of instinctive bias was to say, you know, the world that contains me is the best world, right? I mean, we do it, uh, you know, ask a Frenchman what the best culture in the world is. And, you know, the odds are pretty high he's going to say France, right? And ask an Australian, he'll say Australia. So, uh, we do the same thing with historical epochs. We say, well, I live now, so this is the best. And then we have this narrative of perpetual progress saying, well, you know, the most recent is always the best. Up, update your software. It's the best version, right? Update your computer. It's the newest, strongest, fastest. It's the best. So we do the same thing with society, although, <clears throat> you know, they're really if you look at the evidence, things start to look very differently. But every society loves, um, you have a big bug flying around in your yeah, studio do there, that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Sometimes it flies in front of the camera. <laughs> yeah. Like, man, that's a pterodactyl in there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little uh, Easter egg. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, you should just pluck it out of the air and eat it. <laughs> because, you know, one of the the interesting uh, contributors to this misconception is that, uh, you know, when someone from Europe uh, goes to the New World and they don't understand how things work there, they starve. So there's the famous story of, uh, you know, the pilgrims and the, the local Indians had to come and show them like, no, here's how you grow something here. You have to put a little fish in the hole to fertilize the seed and da, 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 da. Because the soil is different from what you're used to in England or France or, you know, whatever. Um, so what happens is you go to a new environment. You don't know how things work. You don't know what's edible. You don't understand the seasons and the soil and everything else. And so you starve. And the ones who don't starve or who, you know, take back the stories say, oh, my God, everyone's starving over there. But they're starving because you don't know how things work there, not because there's no food there. You just don't know what's edible. So I, I often think of I don't know if I wrote about this in the book or not, but uh, there's a film by Werner Herzog called uh, Rescue Dawn starring Christian Bale. I don't know if you've seen that. It's yeah. about a, a pilot um, who shot down in the Vietnam War. He shot down over Laos and, and taken you know, to a prisoner of war camp. And, um, you know, they're all starving because, you know, the, the Viet Cong hardly feed them anything. And so Christian Bale uh, 
escapes from the prisoner of war camp and he is uh you know going through the jungle trying to to get back to the americans and he gets caught by a group of Viet Cong and he's been starving. He was starving at the camp, of course, but now he's been starving in the five or six days that he was going through the jungle, totally starving. There's a scene where he like catches a snake and pounds its head on a rock and eats this raw snake. And, you know, Werner Herzog being Werner Herzog, he actually made Christian Bale eat a dead snake, you know, on camera and he lost 40 pounds for the role or something. But anyway, the, there's this scene where he's captured by the Viet Cong and they're taking him back to the camp and they're going along this, this path. And one of the Vietnamese guys breaks a, a sapling and sort of forms like a little tennis racket head at the top of the sapling, you know, ties it off. And then he takes some other... Um, twig and sort of wraps it around so there's a bit of a mesh and this this little badminton racket thing and then he takes some uh sap from a tree and smears it on this tennis racket and then they get back on the trail and they start jogging down the trail and there are these bugs these big like locust looking bugs that are flying around and every once in a while one flies near the guy and he puts up his tennis racket and the bug sticks to the sap that he's put on there and then you just see him do this a few times as they're going down this path and then they stop another rest stop and they light a little fire and this guy <laughs> takes his little badminton racket and he puts it over the fire and he roasts these bugs and they're like shrimp and then he eats these delicious bugs and you see Christian Bale just looking at him like, oh my God, like these things were around the whole time. I had no idea you could eat them. There's flying shrimp all over the place here, right? It's just like this, <laughs> this incredible sense that we have that like, because I don't know how to live here, this place is inhospitable. This place is impossible to live in. Whereas people who've been living here for generations, they know perfectly well how to live there. Yeah, I mean, it's like most animals don't look like they're running around kind of confused and and as, as to where to find food. They tend to kind of have the kind of <laughs> niches where they instinctively know what to do, right? Yeah. It's not, not doesn't seem to be yeah. that stressful uh, a way to live. But um, yeah, I mean, so with Hobbes, you also, you know, linking back to what we were talking about with fear earlier. Yeah. Was it he who said that he was, he was, his mother gave birth to twins, him and fear? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because the Spanish Armada was like just off the coast uh, when he was born. Everyone knew things were going to be really bad really soon. And then he's, right. and then his whole life was just, you know, one disaster after another. He was exiled from England because of something he'd written and his books were burned. And there was a, uh, you know, a, a sentence, a death sentence on him. So he fled to France. And then I forget if they were. Dutch or, or that's there was some other war and he was on the wrong side of that so then he had to flee somewhere else he was just constantly running for for his life and and um when he was writing Leviathan he had some terrible illness or he thought he was going to die he was like in bed for three months I mean the guy's life was really hard and uh you know so he projected a lot of his personal experience uh, onto prehistory and just assumed like, well, if this is the best, it must have been really bad back then, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, it's not yeah. science. It's it's more psychology, I think, than anything else. Yeah, I think this, as you say, this projection onto nature is just seeing it all as like existence is just being hostile and negative, um, where it's really his his issues really rather than an objective look at, at nature. Uh, yeah, and, and I guess one of the other things is this idea that it was a constant war of all against all, right? Whereas the actual evidence seems to suggest that if you don't have accumulated resources, there isn't really any point in going to war. And you know, bands of people can seem to kind of get along just fine occupying the same kind of area. Yeah, yeah. There is, you know, if population remains steady uh, and remains in a um, you know, correlated with resources as it does with all animals, um, 
then there's really nothing to fight about, right? It's when population starts growing, then access to resources becomes constricted and conflictive, um, whether that's because of uh, agriculture or, or some other reason, you know, as we described earlier, where there was sort of a natural um, sequence of events that led to higher population and then reduction in resources. Um, there's really nothing to fight about. Um, you know, one of the things Hobbes said, his, his whole quote, the part that's really well known is nasty, brutish, and short, but the, the whole quote is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Um, and it, he was wrong on every one of those counts, uh, as you allude to, solitary. Humans never have been solitary. We are and always have been an extremely social species. Um, you know, chimps and bonobos, which are extremely closely related to us, are both very highly uh, social species. And so, you know, we've never been solitary. More people live alone right now than have ever lived alone in the entire history of our species. Um, and, you know, that leads to severe uh, psychological damage, whether we're talking about, you know, old people who are living alone in apartments or prisoners uh, who are sentenced to solitary confinement. You know, to think about how important society is to us, think about the fact that the worst of the worst of the worst are sentenced to solitude, right? People in prisons would rather be with the general population, which includes guys, you know, who are going to beat the hell out of you in the shower, or maybe stick a shiv in your back, or, you know, like, they're not the kind of people you would generally want to hang out with. But prisoners would with other prisoners than be in solitary confinement. That's how bad it is. Um, so, yeah, we are not a solitary species. Uh, a poor, you know, relates to poverty is an invention of agriculture. Hunter-gatherer people don't feel impoverished because everyone has what they need and everyone has roughly the same. Poverty is a relative concept, right? I'm impoverished relative to you, uh, not relative to any sort of objective standard. Um, so solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, you know, we've talked about that a fair bit. And short, uh, people still believe that we've doubled the human lifespan. And this, this astounds me. This is a wall I've been banging my head against for 20 years. And I've just accepted that, you know, the wall's going to outlast my head for sure. Um, but people believe that, uh, you know, everyone died at 35. There's a, a New Yorker cartoon that almost made me cancel my subscription. Uh, there's a couple of, you know, cavemen sitting there. And the one guy says, I, I just don't get it. Uh, you know, all our food is organic. The water's clean. The air is clean. And still we all die at 35. I thought, oh my God, even the New Yorker, where's your fact checkers? <laughs> so uh, just to put that to rest, uh, Homo sapiens, our species, typically lives into its 70s and 80s. The only reason anyone says that the average lifespan is 35 is because they're including infant mortality, which is quite high in most hunter-gatherer groups. So if you have, you know, 30% of babies die within the first five or six years of life, and you count them statistically, you add them to the pool, life expectancy at birth will be under 40 years. But that doesn't mean that any human being has ever been old at 35. That's not how it works. Right. And on the, the solitary uh, point, I, there's this interesting phenomenon of from Hobbes forward through to who you refer to as the neo-Hobbesians, like uh, Richard Dawkins and Steven Pinker, who are kind of arguing for this, this narrative. Um, there can often be this very simple version of, of 
Darwinian logic where they say, well, you know, it has to be the selfish individual, the selfish gene, you know, whatever the unit is, it's all about them and their selfish behavior. And that's what should be selected for. And I think Dawkins writes about this, that the idea of if someone evolves a selfish trait, that will inherently just kind of spread um, because that's how evolution works. But it seems to me very simple that in a community of 100 people, if I look out for myself, I've got one person who's got my back. If we all engage in kind of looking out for each other, I've got 99 people who are going to going to kind of who've got my back, right? So that network structure seems you know, of sharing seems far more um, likely to to be selected for than this this um, the selfishness, right? Yeah, and and uh, you know I'm perplexed by Dawkins insistence on this um the advantage of the selfish selfish infiltrator uh which is the phrase that he uses um because i know that he respects darwin more than any thinker in ever uh and he's read darwin quite closely and darwin totally disagrees with that view um you know darwin writes about cooperation uh and mutual aid far more than he writes about selfishness. He writes about love. He uses the word love uh, repeatedly in his works. Um, and he makes the argument explicitly that you just made, that the, the society that cooperates and looks out for each other is going to outcompete any other society that doesn't. Um, so you would think that cooperation would be a driving evolutionary trait in our species, which it is. And the thing about these arguments that are made by Darwin and Pinker and uh, Matt Ridley is, uh, is another one, uh, they're, they're the kind of arguments that make sense as a thought experiment. But when you do the most cursory reading of, of anthropology uh, anthropology and the, the literature gathered by anthropologists, you see that it doesn't work at all that way in actual hunter-gatherer societies. So to me, it, you know, it, it smacks of propaganda more than science um, because they want to believe this is true, I guess. I, I, I hate to you know, uh, have any kind of conjecture on people's motivations. But I don't understand, especially someone like Dawkins, who knows the literature and understands evolution way better than, than I do, uh, how he hasn't understood this. Um, you know, hunter-gatherer societies have, as we were talking about earlier, evolved mechanisms for controlling selfish individuals, ranging from ridicule, to a stern talking to, to a hunting accident. They know what happens when somebody, um, you know, their heart becomes too hot, as I think one of the, the Kung San people described it. Uh, violence breaks out. Somebody gets killed. Somebody gets hurt. There are weapons around. There are knives and arrows and spears. And somebody gets too angry, too full of themselves, then somebody's going to be hurt. And so, you know, when you look at the way things actually happen in the real world, you realize that this sort of thought experiment that they run where they say, well, wait a minute, if in an egalitarian society, all you need is one psychopathic individual to come along he's going to eat all the food he's going to have sex with all the women and he and his genes are going to take over and so it's impossible for an egalitarian society to exist case closed and you're like but you haven't looked at the world right you haven't looked at reality um it's it's a very strange conundrum that that they present these ideas as if they make sense when quite clearly they don't function in the real world. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned about being cautious when um, speculating about the motivations of the kind of neo Hobbesians, but I think it is important. To, well, there's an important point, I guess I'd like to make of um, what I think might be an unconscious motivation when the system serves you. I think these people probably genuinely believe what they're saying, but there is some unconscious bias towards trying to justify a system and, if you take Matt Ridley, for example, who you mentioned in his book, The Rational Optimist, I mean, this is 
not only does he have all the kind of standard markers of privilege, he's, you know, Eton educated, Oxford educated, member of the House of Lords in the UK, um, head of a bank. That I remember when his bank, Northern Rock, collapsed and there was this huge hemorrhaging of, of tax, you know, payer money from the public sector to the private sector to bail out the banks. And and he's this guy who's writing this book saying, don't worry, this, this system is perfect. It's great. Like, it's yeah. and like, well, you're the guy who's sitting on top of the pile. <laughs> like, I think it's yeah. worth questioning, like, since the system is serving you so well, maybe you're not unbiased. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing to see that, you know, and then Steven Pinker writes a book arguing the same thing. And uh, Bill Gates says it's his favorite book of all time. Like, no kidding. Really? You really so billionaires and Harvard professors all think everything's going great. No kidding. Uh, I guess it is, you know, for them. Um, yeah, yeah. Matt Ridley cracks me up. His his book was really funny. I in the sort of first draft of Civilized to Death, I really spent a lot more time making fun of Matt Ridley, and my editor convinced me to cut that way back. So there's maybe 10% of it made it through to the final book. But The Rational Optimist is one of the most, like, lunatic books I've ever read. Like, he starts off saying, you know, everything is better. Everything has gotten better. You know, we have, and he does this whole list where he's like, you know, contemporary people, we have more, um, you know, nanometers. We have more rocket launchers. We have more mango slicers. We have more tennis rackets. We have more free, uh, clean air. I'm like, what is he talking about? First of all, do you measure uh, the health of a society based upon its mango slicers? I, I don't know what, where the hell that came from. Or tennis rackets, as if, you know, poor hunter-gatherer people didn't have any tennis rackets. And then, like, free air or, or uh, clean air. How do we have more clean air? now than 10,000 years ago before industry. Like, I, I don't even know what he's talking about. Um, you know, but that message is met with great approval because societies like humans, like individuals love to be praised and love to be told, you know, you're doing it right. This is, this is, you're doing a good job. So it's pretty easy to sell books that say everything's great. It's a lot harder to sell books that say, uh, you know, question the premise. <laughs> yeah. yeah the only and also not everyone, I was going to say, go. not everyone who's Oxford educated is uh, necessarily a bad guy. <laughs> that's, I, that's my, all my education was there. So I, uh, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I know. Um, I know. <laughs> to uh, drop that in. But I, um, yeah, I, I, with the clean air um, point, I was utterly baffled when I read that. You, you left that bit in the 10% in the book. And um, the only thing I could think of is that he's choosing some arbitrary point of like 100 years ago, maybe in London, when it was like smoggy for the Industrial Revolution. But like, that is not any <laughs> robust intellectual argument of, <laughs> of any long term progress. Yeah, well, that's a that's a common trick. Um, you know, when you're arguing with someone about whether uh, progress is a real thing, if, if civilization is an advance, you know, they'll talk about the past as if Victorian England and the Stone Age are the same thing. And so they can sort of switch around depending upon what uh, matrix we're talking about. I, I remember he says something about long drop toilets or something as well you know like sewage systems have improved and like yeah okay you know tell it to the hunter gatherers i don't know yeah i mean there's also a bit you're talking about stephen pinker's book the better angels of our nature um which is again arguing this kind of story of progress and how in under hunter gatherers he's including um a whole bunch of people who aren't hunter gatherers but i think horticulturalists i think they are people who do have stockpiles of food and using that as evidence that you know um that life before agriculture was 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 kind of you know warlike which just uh, doesn't hold at all right yeah he he's been doing that for a long time and um you know, I, I feel more comfortable uh, maligning his intentions because that has been pointed out to him and by me and, and others. 
And rather than correcting his work, what he's done is he's changed the phrasing in such a way that he sort of slips out of it. So in, um, I think it was the blank slate, and in one of his TED Talks, he has a slide where he's making this argument that um, our ancestors were extremely violent, and so there's been this uh, incredible flourishing of peace. Um, and as you say, he starts with 10 societies that he uses as his baseline to establish what uh, our ancestors' lives must have been like. And of those 10 societies that he names, <clears throat> I think only two or three actually are classified as immediate return hunter-gatherers, which corresponds to our ancestors. The rest is, as you say, are horticulturalists. One of them is, is a society in Australia that has like, uh, you know, boats with outboard motors and like they're totally not hunter gatherers. Um, but yeah, they're hunter gather, they're horticulturalists. Many of them are in Papua New Guinea. They have pigs, they have gardens, they have permanent structures. So obviously they have something worth fighting over. And if you know you're starving and you know that in the next valley over there are pigs and gardens full of yams you have something you have a reason to go raid them um so to yeah to use them as an example of our sort of ancestral uh warlike nature is nonsense and then in this what he did after we pointed out that they're not hunter-gatherers he started labeling them pre-state societies. Um, so, okay, your argument is garbage, but you've changed the words around so that it's harder to nail you down on it. That's just dishonest as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, there was also an inclusion you mentioned of, of I think, some indigenous people in Venezuela, and he was talking about war deaths there, but it turns out they were killed by, by, by European colonizers which just seems like a really yeah. diverse thing to include as evidence that they are innately warlike. Yeah, yeah, they were murdered by uh, gold miners and loggers, and he yeah. includes those as uh, evidence of their warlike nature. Talk yeah. about blaming the victim. It's pretty, right, yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, so yeah. for anyone who's, who's not convinced um, so far, we should probably turn to one of the major, I guess, thrusts um, about arguing for the, the kind of... the hunter gatherer life may be superior to civilized civilized life um and that's around physical health right because i think a lot of people argue they say well modern medicine is so so powerful but it but without acknowledging that the lifestyle of civilization is the thing that creates a lot of the the disease in the first place right that we have to then use the medicine for yeah yeah so uh you know in in cocktail party conversations about this stuff one of the things that comes up often is thank you know we have antibiotics thank god for antibiotics because you know you might want to go live in prehistory but everyone was dying from tuberculosis and smallpox and so on um, but what people don't understand is that virtually all of the greatest killers of humanity uh, are actually results of civilization uh, results of domestication of animals, influenza, uh, tuberculosis, smallpox, these all jumped over from domesticated animals into human populations. Uh, cholera is uh, malaria, are diseases of sedentism, of high population density, of living, you know, in our own filth and open sewers and and um, stagnant water. These are all results of um, static settlements with high population densities. So even if a virus like a smallpox virus or um, uh, you know, tuberculosis entered a hunter-gatherer society 20, 30, 40,000 years ago, um, populations were so spread out that it wouldn't have had the ability to spread through the human population. Uh, you need higher population density for that. And this is probably a good time to point out, because I'm sure some people are thinking, wait a minute, smallpox wiped out a lot of Native American people, and they weren't living in you know, uh, European cities. 
when we talk about hunter gatherers and we talk about agricultural people, we're not, I'm not talking about, you know, brown people versus white people, right? There are, there are plenty of white people who were living as hunter gatherers. There are plenty of brown people who are living in major urban centers in agricultural hierarchical political systems like the Aztecs, the Mayan, the Inca, um, the Iroquois to some extent uh, were agricultural or at least horticultural. Um, so, you know, this isn't, this isn't like a, a simple colonial colonializer versus colonialized uh, dichotomy. This is, uh, these are social systems that uh, have arisen, agriculture has arisen at least five times in different parts of the world independently um, among all different kinds of, you know, racial backgrounds. So it's not, uh, I'm, you know, this isn't a, an anti-white, uh, you know, anti-European discussion. This is about ways of social organization that uh, happened spontaneously given the, the right sort of cascading conditions in various parts of the world. Right. And then I guess the other, uh, the other kind of health issues, right, things like dentistry, where without the kind of modern kind of cereal-based diets, we didn't, we would, you know, it seems that early hunter-gatherers had very good uh, dental health, right? Um, and obviously things like diabetes yeah. and all these other heart problems, these things didn't exist in the same way they do now. Yeah, Weston Price is a really interesting uh, researcher on the dental question. He, I think it was the 1940s or 50s, he went around the world looking at uh, dental health of people all over, and he found that uh, the Western diet uh, was directly responsible for uh, just a huge collapse in people's dental health. And um, yeah, and the same can be said for diabetes, heart disease. Uh, um, so many of the ailments of the modern world, many most, almost all types of cancer are non-existent in skeletal remains. Uh, of pre-agricultural people, you know, even just very sort of simple um, skeletal evidence shows that in the same regions um, where you have skeletal remains before the advent of agriculture in that region and directly after the advent of agriculture in that region, you see even something like physical stature decreases uh, Dramatically, uh, I re I think the uh, in modern day Turkey, uh, there's some skeletal remains there uh, from a few hundred years before agriculture. The average man was about five nine, I believe, and the average woman about five five. And then a thousand years later, when agriculture had been established, the average man was about five six, and the average woman was about five feet. So they just shrank. And then you can also look at the long bones, the femur, and you can see, um, uh, I, forget, I think they're called Harris lines, if I remember correctly. Uh, and what happens is that when a child is growing, if they don't get enough food, they stop growing. And then they get food again. Uh, and this happens, especially in agricultural societies where it's a, a harvest, an annual harvest. If the harvest fails, people don't eat enough until the next harvest, then they start growing again and it leaves a line of particularly dense bone growth where there was uh, a famine. And so you see evidence of frequent famines post-agriculture, before agriculture, no famine. Um, same thing with, uh, you can look at the, uh, the teeth, and there are um, evidence in the teeth that shows nutritional deficiencies in agricultural societies and not in pre-agricultural societies. So, I mean, all the evidence conspires to a very obvious point, which, you know, as you were saying earlier, you don't see animals walking around wondering where the food is in the natural world, right? We are an animal. We had a particular niche. Uh, 
And as we expanded into the world, we filled different niches and we learned how to live in different environments. And we were very good at that. But then something switched where we started controlling the environment. And maybe this is the Old Testament story of the fall of grace, right? The expulsion from Eden. We talked about Gobekli Tepe and, and the sort of end of a seemingly paradisical uh, existence. Um, and, and this is where we got lost. We no longer lived in our home. We no longer lived where we knew how things worked, uh, integrated into our natural environment. And so, you know, we are the equivalent of, um, you know, English bulldogs when we used to be wolves. And so, of course, our health suffers. You know, look at the life of a bulldog compared to the life of a wolf. Now, that bulldog might say, I don't want to be a wolf. If you put me out there with the wolves, I'd be eaten tomorrow. And he's right. That's true. So we're not, we're not like wolves in a cage. We've changed into different kinds of beings. But in order to understand how to bring our lives most closely into alignment with uh, the way we're meant to live, I think we do need to study humans in uh, you know, the pre-state world, see how they lived, how they evolved, what kind of world they evolved to live in, and then replicate that world as much as we can in our modern lives. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great um, solution because unless we're facing kind of collapse, yeah, integrating does seem to be, you know, there's no harm in trying to integrate the lessons um, as much as we can right into to our modern world. Um, but I think it, alongside physical health, mental health is something that seems to me a very clear indicator of where we've gone wrong, right? Like widespread depression, yeah. anxiety, suicide, these things seem to be symptoms of civilization. Um, and also you write about schizophrenia as, you know, something that um, would be potentially channeled into, you know, if, if you're someone who's dealing with schizophrenic symptoms, then maybe you, that's the kind of call to shamanism to use that for some kind of positive, uh, positive benefit for the community rather than something that's been seen as a kind of pathology to be, to be suppressed. Yeah. I, I, in indigenous societies, when someone is hearing voices and, and um, experiencing um, break in the sort of consensus reality, um, the general feeling toward that is that this person is being called to shamanize and that if the society can help this person integrate their um, unusual perspective on reality, then this person will be capable of healing because he or she is able to move between worlds. Um, now, I don't want to romanticize this and say that, you know, there are no, there's no mental um, illness in indigenous societies. There is, I think there's a genetic component to schizophrenia, probably. But, you know, it's kind of like what we were saying earlier about having the impulse toward power or, you know, ego. When a society toward dealing with thing in a healthy way, um, you know, things tend to work out much better. When a society just wants to, you know, pump you full of drugs and, and institutionalize you or, uh, you know, marginalize you, things don't work out well. So one of the things that I looked at in Civilized to Death was uh, outcomes in treatment of schizophrenia in the Western world versus um poor countries in Africa and, and India. I, I, I think um, now I, I'm having, I don't remember if I included this in the book or if this was a podcast, but I interviewed um, a woman who teaches at Stanford who did a study of people hearing voices and how the local society sort of frames that experience, right? So in the United States, 
um, where we're very afraid of this. This is considered a sign of, of insanity. You're schizophrenic. You're going to be institutionalized, you know, drugged at best. Um, the voices tend to say things like, uh, you know, you're, you're a horrible person. You're ugly. Nobody likes you. It's very, very dark, right? Um, whereas in India, uh, one of the places that she studied, the voices say things like, uh, today would be a good day to clean your house, or, you know, you should do the laundry today. And uh, in Senegal, I think was the other place where she uh, talked to people about the voices. The voices said things like, you know, take care of your family. They really love you. And, you know, they're very pro-social messages that people are receiving from these voices. Now, I, in my opinion, I think we all hear voices all the time. Some of us freak out and are afraid of, you know, auditory hallucinations. And other people consider them to be a sign of incipient mental illness and start to, you know, have uh, serious problems from that. So I think the social um, definition and framing of these phenomenon is very important in how people experience them and, um, you know, what kind of effects that they have on their lives. Yeah, definitely. I remember seeing um, some studies on that, just how many people, you know, just surveys amongst university undergraduates, and it's a huge percentage um, experience hearing voices that way more than you would think. I can't, I'm not going to try and invent a number off the top of my head, but, uh, but yeah, you're right that it's, it's really about how you interpret it. Um, and also so on the on the kind of mental health issue of depression and anxiety, um, you also talk about kind of child rearing. And I've, I've long felt this sense that something that's missing from the modern world is communal kind of village based, you know, takes a village to raise a child, that kind of mentality. And that nuclear families can be, um, if they're not running smoothly, it can be very damaging emotionally to, to kids. Um, you refer to it as kind of emotion, uh, culturally sanctioned emotional neglect, which is a phrase that kind of resonated with me um in the book and and there's also this you talk about a study where um they're looking at cultures where um all the violence was predicted by a measure of the bonding between the infant and the parents and also the punishment of of uh, sexual expression in youth which i thought was fascinating there seems to be this real link this intuition that a lot of our derangement in society um, can come from from damage, emotional damage in in, um, in early life. Yeah, the the study you're referring to is by James Prescott, who looked at the anthropological database to see if there was any correlation between uh, mother infant uh, bodily contact measured as how many years of breastfeeding was typical in a given society, um, and uh, acceptance of adolescent expression of sexuality, adolescent experimentation. Um, how do those things correlate with violence within the society and between that society and another society? So, you know, violence um, intra and inter uh, society. And he found there were 27, I think, um, societies that had measures of those four factors. And he found that in 26 of them, uh, significant correlation between um, the sort of posit the, the poverty of mother infant contact and shame around sexuality corresponded highly with uh, violence, both within and outside that society. <clears throat> so the question then becomes, you know, sort of a chicken and egg discussion. Uh, this um, a sad yet inadvertent um, result of other social conditions that lead to those things that lead mothers to give up uh, breastfeeding before the the baby's ready, or that uh, you know create shame around sexuality, or are those things actually integrated into society because they produce violent 
um, individuals. You know, we live in the Western world, you know, we, we, people like Steven Pinker want to tell us how peaceful everything is, but we've got, you know, if you look at our, our, our military budgets, you look at how many people we have walking around armed, um, you know, not with hunting uh, necessary bows and arrows for hunting, but with military uh, weapons, you look at uh, just the, the overall level of violence in the world right now. Um, it's clear that we live in societies that have an interest in producing soldiers, that have an interest in producing people that are um, easy, easily malleable and easily sent off to do horrible things for reasons they don't understand. Um, so, you know, in the section, I was, I, I felt bad in a way in the section of the book talking about parenting because I'm not a parent myself. And I hope that nothing there comes across as a criticism of parents. Um, what I really wanted to try to convey is um, compassion for people who are pushed into a position that is very unnatural for our species and yet told that it should be easy for them because the nuclear family is the, you know, sort of primordial social unit of social organization for our species. And, you know, you should just be a good mother and a good father because it should come naturally to you people don't realize that that's not how we raised uh, children uh, traditionally. And it's crazy to expect one or two parents to be able to handle a couple little primates running around screaming and, you know, all the attention that they need. It's totally unnatural. It's unnatural for the parents. It's unnatural for the children. And so it's no wonder that people are overwhelmed. Uh, you know, in every side of that situation. Um, so I really, I, I hope that section of the book didn't come across as a critique of parents, but as a critique of a society that puts parents in an impossible situation, gives them terrible advice, um, you know, from 150 years ago, <clears throat> telling parents they should so their their little boy's foreskin closed if he masturbates or uh, you know put carbolic acid on little girl's clitoris if she touches herself inappropriately. This was in the you know the best-selling parenting guidebook in the United States. Um, you know, to now where where parents are told, you know, if your if your baby cries at night, you have to let her cry it out. You have to put her alone in a dark room in her crib and just let her cry until she falls asleep. Where is uh, the least bit of evolutionary compassion there? What infant primate spends the night alone in the darkness and survives to the next morning? None. You know, baby monkeys, baby chimps, baby bonobos, their mothers don't put them on a branch and say, I'll be back in the morning, you know, have a good night. Of course, the baby cries and freaks out. It's an, it's a, an infant primate. And for millions of years, an infant primate that's left alone in the darkness uh, is dead by morning. So, yeah, we traumatize children um, habitually and unthinkingly because we live in a society that tells us that's normal. Right. Yeah, no, it, it definitely didn't come across as, um, as unfair on the parents when I read it. Um, so maybe, maybe to end on, we should, we should give a bit of, bit of hope of if we don't, um, you know, one avenue is collapse and the other is at the possibility of integrating, as you mentioned, kind of insights, these insights into our society. Maybe we could quickly just mention some of the things that you think might be the kinds of things we could integrate into our society. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I, I think, you know, I'm sure you've read Joseph Campbell or, or you're familiar with his work, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, he argued that he was a mythologist who had, had studied uh, origin myths of societies all over the world. And he found that 
basically every society has pretty much the same story, which is the story of the young person who goes out into the world, uh, has a series of uh, perplexing experiences, near-death experiences, um, meets all sorts of interesting characters, learns things from them, and eventually goes back home um, fortified with knowledge and wisdom that he or she has gained in this journey, right? It's, um, it's the Odyssey. It's, you know, the alchemist. It's, it's basically uh, the oldest story ever told. Um, and when I look at our species, I see that we are engaged in that kind of a journey. Uh, we have left our home, right, as we were referring to earlier, our, our niches where we knew how things work. We go out and we manipulate the world and we go into space and we go into mines a mile beneath the surface of the planet. We go into all sorts of environments. We explore, we learn, we have many near-death experiences as a species. Um, and at some point, we realize that the best possible place for us is the place we came from, right? Um, eventually, Odysseus returns. He goes home. Uh, there comes a point in every journey where you say, okay, I'm ready to go home now. I've, I have enough. I've gathered enough experience. And so... The best case scenario that I see for our species is that we are right now, we're at this very interesting historical moment where 20 years ago, people were still, everything was still outward, um, looking to the new, looking to new and improved. It's more technological, more industrial, margarine's better than butter. You know, everything's getting better and better and better. And for the first time, kids now know they're not going to have as much money as their parents did. Their quality of life is not going to be as high as their parents in material terms. Um, the planet is reaching its carrying capacity. Fisheries are collapsing. Uh, Chernobyl's exploding. Fukushima is melting down. Uh, religion, you know, Catholicism, Christianity is sort of being exposed as a, a fraud. Uh, so much of what was believed in 20 or 30 years ago has been, is collapsing. And people are turning for their wisdom, they're turning backward. And it might be something as trivial as, you know, handcrafted microbrew as opposed to, you know, Budweiser or something. Um, or it can be expressed as paleo nutrition or Wim Hof, you know, jumping in cold water once a day or evolutionary medicine or people like you looking uh, at neurochemistry in terms of psychedelics and um, ritualistic practices that have existed in our species for, for millennia. Um, it, it just seems like the entire culture is shifting and looking back for answers rather than looking further out. And uh, I, I hope that that's a harbinger of a return to home. But of course, when we get back home, it won't be the same because we will have changed so much. So I'm not advocating, you know, that we all become hunter gatherers. What I'm advocating is that we look at our hunter gatherer past, choose the aspects of that past um, that we can bring into the modern world and uh, including our relationship with the natural world and bring the technologies that enable us to do that so that we can integrate the present and the past in a way that's most beneficial for us and the other beings on the planet. Um, so we know how to make energy from the sky now. We don't need to dig up oil and coal anymore. We know how to control um we know how to have as much sex as we want 
uh, and have as many babies as we want. And so we can limit population, not through genocide or disease or disaster, simply by saying, incentivizing people not to have children. Um, most people now who are having the most children are doing so as a way of ensuring their old age. If we instituted some sort of a global minimum uh, income so that people knew that they would be financially secure, even if they have no children at all, and maybe get even get a bonus for not having children, you eliminate the number one motivation for overpopulation. If we could reduce through natural means, I mean, through natural die off, not through, uh, I'm not advocating, you know, any kind of uh, genocide or anything, just incentivizing people to have fewer children. If we could get global population down to a billion people, 500 million people, those people would be living in paradise. You wouldn't need to worry about overfishing. You wouldn't need to worry about overgrazing. You wouldn't need to worry about preserving tiny little pockets of natural space for the other animals to live in um, because there would be plenty of natural space. Um, so anyway, that's what I hope. I hope that we, we figure out a way of distributing resources more equitably and in so doing incentivize people to have fewer children, consume fewer resources um, and we sort of back out of this corner that we've painted ourselves into uh, without uh, global collapse. Yeah. Whether that's going to happen or not is anyone's guess. Yeah, well, at least it's a positive possibility to end on. Yeah, this has been wonderful. Thank you for your time. <laughs> um, where would you send people to if they want to look into your work more? Um, my website is thatchrisryan.com. And uh, they can see summaries of my books, some videos of various talks I've given, um, and also find my podcast, which is called Tangentially Speaking. Great. Highly recommend it. And thanks again. Thank you. It's been fun. Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.